Morning Culture Church. My name is Dijanae Gaines. I'm so happy that you've joined us this Sunday morning virtually. Um, I just want to um, let you guys know that men's Bible study is this week at 7 p.m. Um, so look out for the Zoom IDs in the text message. Um, and then if you want to get more information or have any questions about Bible study or want to simply just join, um, you guys can email us info at culturechurch.org. Um, so once again, I'm just so happy you guys have joined us and with rules lifting and things lifting, it's kind of like a uh, big sigh of relief kind of um, in a way, you know what I mean? Because um, Corona is still out there. However, um, we do get to join with the people we love again safely with precautions and different things like that. So please guys just stay safe, stay blessed. And I'm so happy you guys joined us. Let's just pray for the service really quickly. Dear Lord, thank you for everything that you've done in our lives recently. No matter what has been going on recently in the world, in America, in our country, um, we still appreciate you and your work. Um, just bless everybody that's hurting right now. Bless everybody that's struggling right now. Bless everybody that's nervous about going back to work or whatever it is with, um, you know, um, Corona's still out and different things like that. But um, we just know that you cover us and we know that you'll protect us and you keep us safe. And I also pray for my dad, Pastor John, um, during the service so that you just touch on him and um, put your words in him um, so that he can convey the message that you want him to. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the service. Good morning, church. How are you? This is our 14th week being out displaced from church and uh, doing this online church thing. And I think we've come a long way. I know that God has taught us a lot. He's taught me a lot. Uh, looking forward for uh, when the church doors open and we're able to get back in there. Uh, we're going to try to continue to have this online service to uh, this platform to offer uh, for those that are not able to make it. Now, I know you probably just watched the news and you saw that uh, the governor has allowed places of worship to be open. Uh, we're not there yet. I really am asking for your prayers. I'm asking for you to uh, petition God for uh, us to be able to come back together, not just for the sake of coming back together, but to come back together safely so that those that we care and we love about are secure and safe um, I just would love to see you all again, give you all a big hug. Some of you have seen, I know I've tried to talk to some of you, uh, so just keep that in your prayers. Also, if you know anyone that may have a building that we could use, that we could rent, that's in Williamstown or Gloucester Township, um, preferably Gloucester Township, not Gloucester County, Gloucester Township uh, or Williamstown area, we would love to talk to them about that as well. Um, if not, we're going to probably end up going back to the VFW. So I would ask prayers. And if you know anybody that may have something that may work for us, hey, shoot us a wire, uh, a wire, man, that be, that dates me. That's old time stuff. I know my kids are laughing at me right now. It's all good. Um, hit me up, show me an e shoot me an email at info at culturechurch.org. Um, <clears throat> we would love to hear from you concerning that. So we're going to get started here uh, with our 14th church at home service. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That was our discussion last week, and we looked at yesterday, and one of the things we looked at in yesterday was that the origins of man biblically. We saw in Genesis how God created man, and he breathed the breath and life of him, and he became into him, and he became a living soul. Then we looked at yesterday being humanity. How does humanity as far as science classify us as human beings. And we looked at that. Uh, then we saw that the origins of racism was really found in the fall. In the fall of man, the minute man sinned, his ego got distorted and he began to not look at himself properly and had to then look at others and find a way to make, them, make himself feel better than others. That was kind of the origins of racism. 
And what we ended up seeing is that we have to look back at yesterday because we're facing a lot of crazy issues. We're facing a lot of the stuff. We're seeing all this stuff on the news and on television. And we have to look back at yesterday to understand what we see today. And that would give us a hope for tomorrow. Another little story I'd like to tell you, last Sunday I had a friend ask me, in light of all that's going on, they watched the sermon and we talked about it, we talked about the issues that are going on, and one of the things they asked me was, is how do we, and they weren't just because this was a white person, you know, I hate using these classifications, but I'm, I have to use it just because of the context of what we're talking about, and they were basically saying, how do we respond to the things that we're seeing? Hey, what he was saying, they're saying to me that we agree that this stuff is wrong. We admit it. So what do we do now? How do we respond? And I really think that our response uh, is in two parts. The first part is our individual response. We have a personal responsibility. We have um, to answer within ourselves how do we make sense of what we're seeing? Then there's a church responsibility, and, and we make up that church part, right? So the, the, there's a church responsibility that we have to address as well. And my hope and my prayer is that at the end of this discussion that maybe you might have been challenged a little bit and maybe even be able to see where you play as an individual person and also how you fit into the big scheme of things as a being part of the church as fixing this problem. So that's my hope, that's my prayer. So let's dig in. I have an opening illustration I wanna show you, I wanna to talk to you about, and it's really about the stuff we wear. Now, today I got on my little shirt, you know, my little embroidery things. Hey, one of the things that I was getting back involved with while we were in the, in our, uh, stuck in our houses and all that kind of stuff. So the things that we wear, and how we wear them many times can be an expression of how we feel inside and also, or maybe even how we want to feel inside. What I mean by that is we've all got some way that we wear our clothes. Like some people wear their clothes baggy, some people wear their clothes tight, you know, and it changes through the years and um, trends change. Uh, the, what, what's cool in your dress changes. There even have been whole groups of people that uh, have come out of this and like you have people that are into what's called goth and they wear really dark clothing and um, you have preppy people that you know they've got your boat shoes on and they got their shorts and their button-up shirt then you got your sporty people that you know they always walk in their new their brand new sneakers can't have a scratch on them and their jogging pants and all that kind of stuff so really clothing is just an expression sometimes on how we feel on the inside uh, but it's there are times that when we see what somebody is wearing, it can be an indication of a bigger problem, right? So if we see somebody that maybe coming to work or going to school and they're wearing the same clothes every day, that could be an indication that there's a problem in their life financially. Or maybe you see somebody and their clothes are tattered or beaten and they're dirty. Maybe they need your help in some way. So we can take certain liberties in looking at how a person is dressed. Not their color, not any of that stuff, but just their attire and what they're presenting to the world to kind of get a feel for what's going on on the inside. Now, we have been dealing with what we see in this world today. Again, we're back to today. We're dealing with what we see in the world today. And, and we, we're not crazy about what we see. And what was what's pretty amazing is I've even seen this response in the whole world. The whole world is looking at America now. And how are you going to deal with this problem? So we have to deal with it. First, here in this country, us, we have to deal with it. And we have to make sense of what we see. So that's kind of where we were last week and bleeding into this week. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about how I ended last week. Last week we ended with an acronym, if you remember, PACT. It's a word. It means an agreement or um, some type of a contract between two people. But we looked at it from an, uh, as an acronym and we, we, we defined um, what those four areas in the word PACT mean. P meaning 
uh, protest, A meaning acknowledge, C, commit, and T, together, or teamwork. So we're going to dig into that from a biblical context, because we kind of talked about it, I threw it out there, but I wanted us this week to really kind of dig into this thing from a biblical sense, and maybe understand biblically what each part this looks like, and maybe how God would have us to do that. So I'm going to begin with the first letter, P, and we talked about protests. Now, we've seen these protests today, right? We've seen marches. We've seen uh, all kind of crazy stuff, rioting and looting, and I don't agree with any of that stuff. But we've seen these things happening in the news today, protesting. We've even read about them years ago, you know, Dr. King marching in the 60s, protesting what was going on. So let's look at this from a biblical perspective and a story about a young woman who was put in a very interesting situation. So if you will, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Esther, uh, chapter 4, and we're going to read from verses 1 through 5. Esther chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him, but she sent clothes to him for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathik, one of the king's eunuchs, aside to attend her, assigned to attend her. And he ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. Now, what was troubling Mordecai, we didn't go there, but what had happened was there was this guy named Haman. He was a bad dude. He was the one that they would go boo about all the time. So Haman was uh, a guy that was really against the Jews, and he was trying to make himself better than the Jews. He was trying to exalt himself higher than the Jews. Remember, we talked about that before. So in making, trying to make himself better than the Jews, he figured the best thing to do is for him to wipe them out, to have them all killed. So he went to the king and he had the king give him the authority to write a new law into place that says that on a specific, on a specific day that all the other nationalities within the Persian Empire could go and attack the Israelites or the Hebrew people and just wipe them out like mass genocide. We've seen this type of stuff throughout history, right? We've seen it uh, in the black community. We've seen it in the Jewish community with Adolf Hitler. We've seen this type of a thing many times before, but here we're seeing it in a biblical sense. Here's this man made this law and this, the king signed it, put his ring on as a seal of approval, and now it became law. And that information was just passed on to Mordecai and the rest of the Jewish people in the Persian Empire. And this was Mordecai's response. Put on sackcloth and ashes, and he stood in the king's gate, and he was wailing. You know, it, it's like crying out, because you need to be heard. So now he was showing what was going on on the inside of him. Now, what did sackcloth and ashes mean? Let's talk about that quickly. In the Bible, we read this all of the time, that they, they tore their clothes and they, they, they put on sackcloth and ashes. People did this for a couple different reasons. One of the reasons why they did this was for mourning. They would mourn somebody's death or something that was going to happen that was mean or evil. Or they, or they just wish, it's, it's like a form of protesting. They would also do it in a form of repentance. It was a sign of them showing there was a change that went on in the inside of them. So just like wearing our clothes, just like the type of stuff we wear, there's times that you can, as we said, when you look at somebody in their clothes, it's an outward sign of an inward change, kind of like baptism, right? Now, sackcloth itself, what was that? You know, you remember when Aunt Mary would give you that itchy sweater? 
or, or your mom would buy you that itchy sweater and you she would almost make you wear it. But when you wore it, it was like itching you. It felt like little fingers digging into your skin the whole time. You wanted to just rip it off and just rip your skin apart. Well, that's kind of what sackcloth was like to the 10th power. Sackcloth was literally made from goat's hair. I think specifically black goat's hair, not that it was an issue, but that was just kind of what it was. And it would just irritate you constantly. You know, all I can think of is, what's the most comfortable piece of clothing that you wear? Underwear. Everybody likes their drawers, everybody likes they special ones, you know, your special ones that you've had for 20 years and they fit real comfortable on you. Well, imagine if your favorite underwear was made out of goat's hair and it just itched you and it was irritating. That's what putting on the sackcloth was like. Now, it also says ashes. Now, ashes typically represented that what I'm trying to show you is so serious that it has become a national distress. It's such a problem that this is bigger than just me as an individual or I'm mourning or I'm repenting that this is going to affect us as a people, it, uh, you know, nationally, completely. So that's kind of what sackcloth and ashes meant. And this is what you see presented by Mordecai at the king's gate, fussing and complaining, irritated, wearing ashes, showing that this is serious. This is something big that's happening. Now, let me kind of just go over the rest of chapter four. We're not going to read everything because we're going to get through like six chapters or eight, four chapters today. So I just want to kind of summarize some of them. The rest of chapter four, from Mordecai doing this, he gets Esther's attention, right? Because if you're protesting, if you're wearing this and you're yelling and all that, you're trying to get someone's attention. So he gets Esther's attention and then Esther sends word to him like, yo, what is wrong with Mordecai? What is, and he begins to explain, yo, I don't know whether you know this, but your, your husband, the king, just dropped this new law that on this specific day, they're going to attack and kill all of us Jews and we can't do anything about it. Esther's like, well, whoa, well, what do you want me to do about it? What do you want me to do? How, how can I the, I, the king won't even talk to me, Esther's basically saying. Because there's a problem here. Esther's dilemma was that for the king to talk to her, for her to talk to the king, he had to summon her. She wasn't allowed just to show up and just say, hey, king, I'm home. What's good? She couldn't do that. She actually had to be summoned. The king had to call her. And he hadn't called her in about a month. Look at what Mordecai says to her. Because he understands what's going on in the kingdom. He understands the rules of the land. But he understands because of what he's showing on the outside of him, his sackcloth and ashes and his wailing, he's trying to show, yo, this is serious and we've got to do something about it. So let's read a little bit more in chapter 4. And I'm going to read verses 12 through 14. Esther just tells him that she can't go before the king because he hasn't talked to her in a month. Here's Mordecai's reply. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. I love how... Mordecai's faith. Mordecai is saying, this looks so dismal, and, but I know my God's going to do something about this. He says, deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. You'll get wiped out. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position. Who knows whether the reason you were made king, I mean queen, the, the reason that you were living with me, Mordecai, your uncle, and for them to come and get you, who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. This is Mordecai's famous words. 
for such a time as this, that you were put into this role by God, maybe, just maybe, for you to do something so dramatic that it's going to help your people and the story be told for all time. This was her problem. Now, as I said, we're talking about protesting. We're talking about drawing attention to what's been going on in our nation. So the first thing is, we have to draw attention to the problem. Now, when we draw attention to the problem in our protests, this has to be an individual choice. This has to be something that you want to do. Because remember, when you go to do this thing, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be like wearing that uh, uh, underwear of goat hair. That's what it's going to be like. So you have to understand that this is an individual uh, decision. Nobody can make it for you. It's interesting. The other week, we um, assisted in the Nine Mile March that went from Glassboro to uh, Deford. We posted up right next to the teachers, uh, what was the, the teachers union representatives is who they were. Um, we, we, we were sitting next to them and we had like 500 water bottles. Uh, they were cold and we had trash bags. And as the march came by, the people, the protesters walked by, we were handing them water, taking their trash. Uh, it was an awesome time. But when I thought about it, I'm saying to myself, this was a nine mile march. I don't know if I could have made nine miles. And you know, I seen people taking losses. Like there was a lady, she was so flushed. We just sat her down under our tent, gave her some water and told her to just sit here, relax and, and, and breathe slowly. Then we get jumped, put her in our car as the crowd went by and drove her down the road and got her caught back up with the rest of the, the marchers. Because you, you have to know that if I'm going to make this type of an individual decision, it has to be for the right reasons. It can't be just to rock with the car out because you're going to get caught up and you're going to be dragged in many different ways. The third thing you have to do is when we're talking about protesting, where you have to ask, how do I protest? What is what is my purpose for protesting? Not purpose, but how can I protest? I understand that this is an individual choice, but how do I make this protest? Look at this. Esther and Mordecai were both protesting. Now, Mordecai, he did his protest. He put on the sackcloth, he uh, uh, put on the ashes, and he went before the king's gate, and he was wailing and screaming. That was his form of protest. Why? Because he needed to get his niece's attention, Queen's Esther's attention. Now, Esther was faced with an issue. Esther had to go appear before this king that could truly cost her her life. So she had to be sure that what she was going to do was the right type of protest. Now, she didn't put on sackcloth and ashes. I'm sure when it came time for her to appear before the king, she did what she was trained to do. She probably got prettied up, put that perfume on, that them red pumps and all that. She, 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 she got herself prettied up so that when the king saw her, that he would be open to hear what she had to say. Because remember, Esther's protest could have cost her her life, her very life. So she had to be sure that this is what she wanted to do. Now, we're talking about protesting and we're talking about the spiritual aspects of protesting because, you know, the, the physical aspect of it, just getting out there and marching or, 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 or drawing attention to the problem because that's what protesting is about, drawing attention to the problem, we need to look at it from a spiritual sense as well. So this is where Esther was. Now that she's figured out that she's realized that she has to do something, because her and her people could be killed, she then has to do something. So let's read verses 15 and 16 in chapter 4, and we're going to see how Esther deals with this. Verse 15, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So look at this. 
The first thing I want you to see when we're talking about spiritual protesting is that there were boundaries in place. Mordecai went as far as the king gate. He didn't go past that. He wouldn't move past that. He went out there, he was yelling and screaming and, and, and looking crazy. Looking, I can only imagine, you're wearing goat's hair and got ash all over, you gotta look wild. But he didn't go past the king's gate because the law said that he couldn't. If he went past the king's gate, he would probably be killed. Now remember, this is a protest, not war. The rules of engagement are different in a protest than they are with war. This is a protest, so we have to maintain boundaries. War is different. War, your, your, your goal is to extend the boundaries that you have and, and, and take back the land. And there is holy war. There is righteous war. But right now, we're talking about protesting. So we have to maintain the boundaries. Even now, Esther. Esther was about to cross a boundary. She was about to push beyond. So she needed to be sure. So there was fasting involved in that. That's the second part of spiritual protest. Boundaries, and the second thing is fasting. Listen, what does fasting do in this sense? Fasting denies the flesh. It, 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 it crucifies it. Because once your flesh is, is, is crucified and is, and is subdued, then clarification of your true motive will stand out. Before that, you could be hyped up on emotion, or you could be hyped up on your own hidden agenda, but fasting and praying, what that does is, that takes the human aspect of it out, because fasting says that I'm going to deny myself of something that I need, that is within my rights as a person, as a child of God. I can eat. God doesn't forbid me not to eat. So I'm going to deny that. Now, the second thing it does is that in that, you feel weak. You can't eat. You haven't eaten. You feel weak. You, you feel like you can't go on. So it forces us, it, it, it pushes us to exercise the spiritual part of us that has to rely on God. What does it say? God is a spirit, and true worshipers must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So because we're now trying to strengthen that spirit man inside of us, Fasting allows that spirit man to trust God more, and now maybe we can hear what he's trying to really guide us to do. The third thing that fasting does is it's an act of humility. I'm going to put my needs aside, and I'm going to submit myself to you, Lord. Why? So that I can understand what needs to be done here. I need to get my orders. Because, see, God sees a humble heart. He knows when you're truly seeking Him to fix a problem. And, of course, it goes without saying, prayer. Prayer goes right along with fasting, talking to Him. Lord, I, I, I'm putting this before you. And when you do that, when we fast, when we deny our flesh, when we remember that our directions are coming from the Lord and we humbly come before Him in this manner, all of a sudden now, He can empower us to protest the way He would want us to. And that is spiritual protesting. Now, as I said, I'm not going to dig through every chapter because we'll be here forever. But I'm going to, let me summarize Esther chapter 5. So Esther then appears before the king. She, she, they wait the three days. They, everybody fasts. So now she gets herself prettied up. She walks before the king. And the whole thing was that if the king extended her, his scepter to her, then that said that he was accepting of her appearing before him. And that's what she did. She appeared. The king extended his scepter to her, which allowed, gave her the permission now to speak to him. And she asked the king, and Haman to come and meet her for dinner the next day. That He said, listen, my queen, I love you. Half the kingdom is yours. Ask me whatever you want. She says, listen, just you and Haman come to my house. I'm going to hook you up with some macaroni and cheese and some, some, some string beans and some barbecue chicken and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to hook up a nice meal. I want you to come over and I want you to come talk to me. So the king says, sure, we're going to do that. Everybody breaks and loads. Haman is angry. He's even more angry now. That's chapter 5. Chapter 6. 
What I need you to see now in chapter six is, is that God is working it all out. He's working it all out. So after they break and now the next day they're going to come meet with, with um, Esther, the king, he can't sleep. He, he's laying in the bed. He's restless. You know how you have those nights. And he gets up and he asked for all the, 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 the annuals or, you know, the, the report of everything that he's done under his reign to be read to him. I don't know, a little narcissistic to me, but he asked it to be read to him. God can function in our dysfunction, remember that. So he asked him, he asked his servants to read his reign. And what he finds out is, is that there was this man named Mordecai that literally saved his life from an assassination attempt. And it was never written that that man Mordecai was honored. So the king goes to Haman because Amon was now second in charge, because remember, he's inching his way up the, 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 the flagpole trying to get to the top by stepping on people's backs. But now he's up there, so the king calls Haman, and he poses his hey, if there's a man that the king delights in, how would we honor him? Haman, thinking that he's talking about him, says, oh, put him on a horse, parade him through the streets, and, you know, all these things. And king says, oh, great job. You know what? Do that to Mordecai. I know Mordecai had to be done. He was like, I am so finished. But what we need to see here is, is that God is working on our problem. The problem that we're protesting about, the thing that we've got us so up in arms about, God hasn't forgotten, and he is working behind the scenes. We need to remember that, because if we remember that, then what happens is we stay in character. We don't go wilding out because God is our focus, and we're just trying to now live out what God has challenged us to do. He's challenged us to protest in whatever way he showed you. Like I said, it could be marching. It could be, I don't know, whatever. Whatever that is, now you're living that out, but you're remembering that the power comes from God so you don't get out of character as you encounter people. Let's get back to our pact, or my goodness, we'll never get through this. So that was P, right? We protest. The next thing is that we acknowledge. Now, this is a hard step. And you know what? Acknowledgement takes time. It's not something that just happens right away. But let's see how the king uh, acknowledges what happened. Let's go to uh, Esther chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther. Remember, they was coming for this, this meal uh, Esther was hooking up. So the, so the king and Haman went to the Queen Esther's banquet. As they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? And it will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet. But no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Who is he, the man who has declared to do such a thing? The king listened to Esther. He heard the problem and he acknowledged it. He acknowledged that there was a problem, that something wasn't right, that what she's saying is real. And you know what? I need to get to the to the bottom of it. And we know what happened, right? You know, it was Haman. It was that wicked dude. And he ended up on a pole, the same pole that he set up for Mordecai, the same pole that he set up to step on the back of somebody else to rise himself higher. He was put on that same pole. But as I said, acknowledgement, we have to remember, takes time. This is a tough step. Let, let me help manage your, your expectations here. We, have, we needed to acknowledge the problem that we're facing today a long time ago. This racist stuff and uh, black men and women and, and people of color have been getting hurt for years. But be patient because you know what? It's, it's just like us. We don't always want to deal with our issues right away. Right? We don't want to deal with the stuff that bothers us right away. So how can we expect a nation, a nation that's made up of who? Us, that don't want to deal with our stuff, to deal with these issues right away. Listen, I don't want 
to admit when I'm wrong. And I'm sure there's those of you that don't like it either, unless all y'all holy folks out there, I don't know. But there's times that I don't want to admit when I'm wrong. Because when I admit that I'm wrong, when, when we admit that there's something broken in us, what it does is it, it bolsters the fact that we are have a low self-esteem already. I already don't feel much about myself as it is, and then if I admit that I'm wrong, then that pushes me even lower. But remember, we talked about that last week. The reason that happened is because when we fell and we started finding our significance in ourself and what we could do and what we could produce, versus gaining our significance from God and how he designed us and how he was going to empower us to function. Once we did that, then we have to make ourselves feel better about ourselves because we know that we can't fix every situation. We don't have the power in every situation. So since that's the case, then we feel less about who we are. So to, do, so, to, to, so to get over that, I have to do what? I have to make myself feel better than other people. Racism. Racism. And just like in my life, I, you know, there's times that I realize that God has allowed me to go through tough things. He's allowed me to go through some problems in my life. Why? So that it draws attention to the thing that I'm ignoring. The thing that I don't want to deal with. It draws attention to it. So expect things to happen. I'm managing expectations here. Remember. We can't expect this nation to change overnight. It's not going to happen. It's a process. Thinking that it'll happen tomorrow is an unrealistic expectation. God can do anything. But let's just manage our expectations so we don't get hurt. And listen, I hear you. I know what you're saying. You're saying to yourself, but listen, we've been dealing with racism in America for a long time. And I get that. And you know what? Let's, let's, let's look at a few facts around the American timeline as it pertains to uh, African Americans. And I know, yep, we're, we're talking about yesterday again. But we have to look at history to help us process what we're dealing today. Let me remind you of a tune. Remember this, this little jingle? I don't know if y'all learned it in school. I did. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That's the rap version. Rock version. 1492, the Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Then there's a classical version. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It was a little jingle we learned to remember history. But it's interesting that 127 years after Columbus landed on Plymouth Rock, somewhere around 1619, the first slave was dropped off in Virginia. It only took 127 years. And that started the African slave trade. So almost from the beginning, slavery was a part of who this country was. The next point in our history? Civil War breaks out. Somewhere around April 12, 1961, industry changes in industry versus farming. The states fighting for the rights to maintain slavery. The fact that we were traveling west and we were uh, uh, acquiring new, new states and who was going to gain control of those states. These were the issues that sparked this civil war that lasted for four years. What kicked it off? The southern states finally just said, you know what? We don't want to be a part of this United States anymore. We're going to have our own government called the Confederacy. President Lincoln sent his soldiers and it started the Civil War. The Civil War ends and we could say that the North was victorious. But in saying that, hundreds and, th hundreds and hundreds, thousands of men were killed. Americans were killed. At the end of the Civil War, they decided to make some changes to the piece of paper that governed this country, the Constitution. And there was something called the 13th Amendment that was signed in January 31st, 1985. And what that did was it abolished slavery. It said, no longer can you just enslave someone and not pay them fairly. 246 years after the first African landed in Virginia, 
It took 246 years for that amendment to happen. A few years later, the 14th Amendment happened. And what that said was in 1968 that anyone who was born in this country or what's called a, nationalized, a, na a naturalized citizen, if you went through the right hoops and you became a citizen of the United States, like if you were brought here, you became a citizen, all of a sudden now, black Americans were now considered a whole person, a citizen. I had rights as a citizen in the United States of America. Then the 15th Amendment happens in 1870. And that gave all citizens the right to vote. And they couldn't be discriminated against or restricted on the basis of race, color, or whether they were uh, a slave in the past. You couldn't discriminate that. That was the 15th Amendment in 1970. And listen, all of that sounds good, but listen, those southern states that wanted to break away, they used other tactics to, to maintain the control, to prevent people of color from voting. They did things like they added polling taxes, literacy tests, vouchers for good character. You had to have a voucher saying that you were a good person. They even incorporated right primary laws, meaning that there were private political parties that conducted the elections. And once it was privatized, then they could say who could come in and vote and who couldn't. This was all done after the 14th and 15th Amendment, after that uh, they were allowed to vote and become we were allowed to be vote to vote and become citizens. But they did these things to maintain their status quo. They wanted to make sure that they maintained control. To do that, to deprive citizenship, or to deprive somebody from their right to vote, or to prevent somebody from exercising their basic privileges and rights as a human being, as, as I said last week, the Constitution said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To do that, it's called disfranchisement or disenfranchisement. And that's what we were experiencing. And that was from 1870 all the way up to 1965. 95 years later, 95 years after the 15th Amendment, in response to murders of voting right activists in Philadelphia and in Mississippi, after those atrocious things happened, all of a sudden it began to draw attention to what was really going on. And the straw that broke the camel's back happened on March 7th, 1965. Alabama state troopers attacked peaceful protesters as they were marching across a bridge in Selma, Alabama. You might have seen the movie. After that, that was it. A bill was introduced, and on August 6th, 1965, the Voting Rights Act was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. Now listen, this thing wasn't perfect, but it was probably the most prolific piece of legislation for equal rights in our history. 363 years later, in 1962, those aspects of the, human, the, the Voting Rights Act that were still a little off was amended to best serve people of color. Listen, I believe in my heart, just like the, the march on Alabama, on, in Selma, Alabama, and those atrocious things that the Alabama State Police did, I believe that the murder of George Floyd could be the same type of catalyst, the same type of a thing that is causing some, some change to begin to happen. Let me finish up here. Once we see the problem and they're acknowledged, we have to commit to find a solution. We have to commit to figure out a way to fix this. King Xerxes committed to a finding a solution because the problem of annihilating the Jews meant that he was going to lose his wife. So he said, you know what, we've got to figure out a way to stop this, to stop this guy Haman and to wipe him out. They began to figure out a way to discuss and fix this issue. 
And just like in, in, in our case, slavery, voting, and in racism in general, people have to be committed to fixing this problem. We have to be committed. Let me review. Pact. P. Protest. Properly, prayerfully, fasting, protest. A. Acknowledge the problem. We've acknowledged it. We're asking for our legislators to acknowledge the problem. But it begins with, with talking with people too, right? And then C, commit to finding a solution. The final letter is T. We have to do this together. We can't be separated. King Xerxes, Esther, Mordecai, the Hebrew nation faced a problem and they had to figure out a way to fix it because Persian law said once a law was written, the law that Haman put into effect couldn't be rebuked because it was sealed with the king's ring and it was written down and it could not be changed. So let's look and see what happens. Let's read Esther 8 and we're going to read verse 8 and then we're going to read verse 11. Esther chapter 8. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. Look at verse 11. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble, protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate and the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of their enemies. So here's the deal. What they said was, we are going to give you the rights to fight back. They found a, pro they found a solution to the problem. And I believe because they found a solution, it brought peace. Listen, they, they not only found a solution, but they didn't want this to happen again. So they not only did they kill Haman, but they killed all his 10 sons too. They found a solution. And because they found a solution, the God, our God, the one true God, there was this remnant of him in Persia. And I believe that's why the wise men knew to look for a star to follow that led them to Jerusalem where young Jesus was, the savior of the world. Here are my final thoughts. Remember I said in the beginning that there's two spot responses to the things that we've seen. There's an individual and there's a church response. Individually, individually, we need to really dig inside of ourselves and, and, and help us, and, 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 that, and, 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 and as we're digging, that we have to f get, get to the root of why we feel the way we feel about these injustices we see. Because you know what? If we don't get to that root, we're going to wear what's on the inside of us on the outside of us. And we're going to protest in some way. Either for the right side of this thing or the, or the wrong side of this thing. We have to then seek God in prayer and fasting. To make sure that what we're thinking and what we're feeling is righteous in God's eyes. Really do that. Then we have to ask God, how do I take a stand? What type of protest should I do? Why am I in the position I'm in? Like Mordecai said, for such a time as this, why am I here? Why am I experiencing this? Because maybe God has something specific for you or I to do. Have faith. Have faith that God is working on our behalf behind the scenes. We can't see it all the time, but know that he is because he hasn't forgotten. And as this problem is acknowledged and, com and a commitment is made, we have to be ready to work together for a better tomorrow. Listen, I find strength, I find comfort and peace in God's word. That's the only thing that helps me make sense because if I go off of my own mind, I'm going to wild out. Look at what God says in Psalm 30, verse 11 and 12. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. If you clothed me with joy, then that means that that joy had to come from a deeper place. Because remember, what we wear on the outside can be a reflection of our inside. So if he's removed 
the wailing from my tongue and he's removed this sackcloth and he's clothed me with joy, then that means that there's something that has to fill me from the inside out. That joy has to come from on the inside. And God promises to do that. And he says in verse 12, that my heart may sing your praise and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. That promise of God doing that is his promise to remove our garment of protest. Either here or in heaven. But in any event, I'm going to fight until he does it. I'm going to fight this thing and not give up. That's my individual responsibility. As a church, this is what I feel we have to say to our church. Racism, political affiliations, religious preferences, issues we have with each other, all of those things have divided our church. Division is Satan's biggest weapon because he knows that if we stand united, nothing will prevail against us. He knows that. But if we allow all of these things, racism, affiliations, political affiliations, religious preferences, all these things, if we allow, then it causes division. And once we have division, then we don't stand in power. Because listen, it's not just about what's happening today, but we need to prepare for tomorrow because the worst days are coming. If you read through end time theology, if you read what's coming, it's not going to be about the color of your skin. It's not going to be about this, that, or the other thing. It's going to be about your affiliation and your relationship to Christ. So if we don't learn to stand together, supporting one another, looking out for one another, what do I mean by that? Listen, if there's a church that needs help, how come our big churches aren't helping the small churches? You never know. You might show up in a small church to help them, and then they drop some science on you that helps you. Because that's a kingdom. That's us working together. That's what he designed. There's a time coming that if we don't prepare for now, our people that we say we love, are not going to be ready for it. So listen, church. We've got to stand strong. Let's commit to making an impact on this nation and on this world as we stand together and uphold what's right. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, family, in a few minutes... I'm going to have some friends come and share with you what it is to have a relationship with God. See, this is important because without that type of a relationship, then the, us putting our own thoughts aside won't happen. We will always act out. And we will step out going to protest and it will turn to rioting and war and looting. And that's not the power of God being displayed. So listen up as they share a little bit what it is to have a relationship with the king. We want to offer you the opportunity to start your personal journey and your personal relationship with Christ. Here at Culture Church, we make it as simple as four simple symbols. It's called the four. My wife, Lena, will explain them to you now. So the first one is a heart. It's just Jesus loves us. Knowing and recognizing that he loves us right where you are, you can come as you are, no matter your situation, your circumstances, he loves you just the way you are and just wants a relationship with you. The second one is a division symbol. It's recognizing that sin separates us from Jesus. And that brings us to the next one, the cross. Because Jesus went to the grave for us, he went to the cross for our sins so that we could have eternal life and that he will always see your potential in yourself that sometimes you don't see. Um, the next symbol is just the question mark. It just shows, are you willing to believe in what Jesus did for you just, just to have a relationship with him? Are you willing to put everything aside and accept Jesus for who he is and believe in that? Hey, thank you, family. Listen. If you'd like to say that prayer today, if you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and enter into this relationship with him and help and, and allow him to begin to change your life from the inside out, clothe you with joy, remove the sackcloth, remove the irritants, 
and fill you with a joy that comes from the inside, that is going to be worn on the outside, and your daily, everyday life will become a protest. If that's you, I want you to just follow me in a simple prayer. You just say right now, Heavenly Father, forgive me. I've done a lot of stuff wrong, and it keeps me bound up. Forgive me. I believe you sent Jesus, your son, to die for me. Forgive me. Come into my life. Fill me with your spirit right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for making me new, for turning my wailing to song. In Jesus' name, amen. Family, I love you. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Again, as I said, remember, reach out to us if you know anybody that could help us out. Maybe you could be. Maybe you were put into this position for such a time as this. God bless. Have a good week.